You're listening to the Online Marketing Made Easy Podcast, episode number 156. Welcome to the Online Marketing Made Easy Podcast. Business advice so easy, you'll feel like you're cheating. And now your host, Amy Porterfield. Well, hey there, Amy Porterfield here, and welcome to another episode of the Online Marketing Made Easy podcast. Today, I have a special guest. His name is Russell Brunson. You likely already know Russell, but just in case you don't, I wanted to share with you how I found out about this guy many, many years ago. You've probably already heard me talk about this program called the New Money Masters that I worked on right before I left the Tony Robbins company. And in this program, Tony interviewed different internet marketing entrepreneurs to find out about their business, some tips and tricks for internet marketing. And he really talked about their lifestyle as well. And I was hooked on internet marketing when I started to hear from some of these experts he brought on that episode. And I was intimately involved with the new Money Masters because I worked on the segment with Marie Forleo. And that really sealed the deal with my friendship with Marie because we got to go back and forth. And she was the only woman featured on this program, which was really cool. Well, the youngest person featured on this program was Russell. I don't remember how old he was at the time, but looking at him now and listening to him, like the sound of his voice, he sounds like he's 16 years old. So I wish I could look that young for that long, but this guy has a special gene for sure. But beyond looking and sounding young, he has actually been in business for about 14 years. He has started and scaled many companies online. He's a best selling author, owns a software company. You likely heard me talk about ClickFunnels before. That's Russell's company. He has a supplement company, a coaching company, and that's just to name a few. The guy is definitely a powerhouse, but he's also completely down to earth, a lot of fun. Even though I've never hung out with him, he seems like a guy that I would like to hang out with. Or Better yet, he seems like a guy Hobie, my husband, would love to hang out with. They seem very similar in terms of their personalities. I also love that Russell was a big-time wrestler in high school and college. And, you know, Hobie was as well. And Cade, now Hobie's so proud. Cade is following in his dad's footsteps. And he went through his first year of high school wrestling, got MVP for freshman. So we're on. It's all about wrestling in the Porterfield house these days. So I got to spend some time with Russell, and I think you're going to love this interview. Here's the deal. He just came out with a book called Expert Secrets. It is fantastic. And you know, I would never recommend something that I didn't think would really add value to your business. You got to get this book. I read the entire book from start to finish, absolutely loved it, took tons of notes, and I want you to get your hands on it. So first of all, to get the book for free, you just have to pay shipping and handling. Go to amyporterfield.com forward slash secrets. So amyporterfield.com forward slash secrets, and it will take you to the page that you can get the book. And I hope you do, because I think I'm going to be talking about it a lot over the next few months, like different strategies and tips that I learned from it and applying to my own business. I want to share that with you. So I want to be talking the same language. So grab the book for sure. Now inside the book, Russell talks about creating a mass movement, and that's what this episode is all about. We're going to get into becoming a charismatic leader, creating a cause, and creating a new opportunity, which has to do with your market and your niche. So we're going to get to that for sure. So I won't make you wait any longer. Let's bring on Russell. Hey, Russell, thanks so much for being on the show. I'm really excited to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited too. Now, before we get into all the details, I wanted to ask you about actually writing another book. I know the process was not easy for you, and I heard you even started from scratch after you had written a bunch. So what was that all about, and why did you feel like you needed to write this book? Yeah, (laughs) it's funny because a lot of my friends who write books, like they consider themselves authors. I've never really considered myself an author, but I'm someone who like, I have stuff I want to share so bad. And so that's been my big focus. And so like I wrote the first book and it turned out really good and it's helped a lot of people. And I, but I swore like I would never write, like write a book again. <laughs> that was like a one-time deal. Cause it was, for me, it's a, I don't know, like I, I wanted to write a really good book. So there's like a lot that goes into them. Yeah. So I took like two years off swearing I'd never write another book again. And then one day, like a lightning bolt of inspiration, I was like, 
I have to write this book. And I knew exactly the title and like, I knew it just became super clear. And I was like, Oh no, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to do it. <laughs> and so like I started it and I don't think I was quite ready for it yet, but like, I just, I'm like, okay, I got to create this book. So I jumped in, I started writing it and we got the point. It was about 240 pages in. It was like almost ready to like send first draft to an editor and stuff like that. And, and I was on a family vacation and it was like two in the morning and I was reading through it all. And I was just like, I don't know. There was something I was like, this, it turned out good, but it wasn't like great. I don't really want to write a good book. Like I don't want to do if it was like great. And so I, I was just, I just learned Snapchat at the times. I had like a couple hundred people following me and I was like, I'm going to like make this real. So I got on Snapchat. I was like, everyone, I'm going to delete this entire book right now. And I highlighted all 240 pages and I clicked delete. And this is like eight months into it. And I was like, that's crazy. (laughs) It was so scary. I'm not going to (laughs) lie. So you completely deleted the whole book on Snapchat, no less, which is even (laughs) cooler. And then you just started over. Like it wasn't what you wanted it to be. And you thought I got to start over. Yeah. It's funny because I I think a lot of times it's like we we're not willing to do that. Like I don't think I was going to be willing to do that. But I was just like, if I'm going to do this, like it's got to be awesome or what's the point of doing it. Right. And so, yeah, I started over and it was kind of cool because because I had done it once I knew the pieces that like I felt were impactful, but I knew that like a lot of it just wasn't. And it was like, okay, how do we really structure this the right way? And, and and gave me a lot more time to kind of reprep and plan and then spend the next seven or eight months writing it again. And the second time, like I'm, I'm really proud of, I'm really proud of what came out at the end. Well, you should be because the book is awesome. I absolutely (laughs) love it. And I loved the first one, but I feel like this one even better. So oh, thank you. That's awesome. It's so good. So we're going to dive into some of the specifics of the book because you start things off with this idea of creating a mass movement, which includes becoming a charismatic leader, creating a cause and identifying a new opportunity. Now I want to break down this process with you because I think my listeners are going to find each of these different sections so incredibly valuable. So if you're cool, I want to just start at the top. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Okay, cool. So you start with talking about becoming a charismatic leader and right at the beginning of the book, I don't want to give it all away, but you mentioned this idea of 1000 true fans. And I know my audience would love this concept, especially as you explain it to them, because they don't have huge lists just yet. They don't have big social media followings. And you're saying you only really need 1000 true fans. How can that be true? Yeah, it's funny. The first time I thought that process, there's a, a guy named Kevin Kelly that wrote an article called The Thousand True Fans. And I had the same thing when I when I first read because you know, you always hear about people like, I've got a million followers on Facebook and I got this and like all the the numbers. Yeah. And as I was reading this article, there's a there's a little excerpt that if you don't mind, I love to read. It says, A true fan is defined as a fan that will buy anything you produce. These diehard fans will drive 200 miles to see you sing. They will buy the hardback and paperback and audible versions of your book. They'll purchase figurines sight unseen. They'll pay for the best of DVD version of your YouTube channel. They'll come to your to your chef's table once a month. And it goes on and on, all these things, right? Where there these are people that are like they love you. It's not just like a customer because that's one thing, but it's like a true fan who who connects with you and you've had an impact on them and they keep coming back to you, right? And they'll buy over and over and over again. It was interesting as I started looking at our customers, we, we started looking at like all of our databases, stuff like that. We started looking through it and and it was interesting how how honestly the, the point where I broke to become like financially free as an expert was that point where I had about a thousand fans. And I kind of define my fans for me, people that bought more than one thing and they they show up to things and they're doing things. And uh, for me, it was like liberating somebody. Okay, thousands, like that's that's doable. Maybe yes. a list of 100,000 or millions, not, but a thousand. If I can connect with a thousand people and serve them at my highest level, that's really what you need to get freedom or that can become your career. And that's, it's pretty exciting when you realize that. It really truly is. And I love that you started there saying, look, you don't need huge email lists to make this work and you don't need tons of social media followers. You just need to be really good at what you do and make that connection as a leader. So I love that that's yeah. where we're starting. Now, a lot of my listeners are incredibly hard workers and they're willing to do whatever it takes to build their dream business. But right from the get-go, they get stuck trying to figure out what an ideal niche is for their business and how to attract their perfect audience. But you have this solid strategy. So can you break down your process of how this works and how to find your, do you say niche or niche? (laughs) <laughs> I hate I the say word. Niche, but I don't, Let's I don't, say I think, niche because I kind of hate the word altogether. I just don't like saying it. So we're just going to say niche. I feel like a fake when I say niche anyway. So it depends on where in the world you live, I think is how you pronounce it. So. I agree. I agree. Okay. So talk to us about th- this process that you write about in the book. Yeah. So when I, it's funny because I got started, I was, it was similar. Like I didn't know where to go or what to do. So I was just kind of like, okay, I'm going to be in 
blah, this business or what I started like throwing out ideas and, and I had no idea if they were, <laughs> there was like any like sound, you know, if that was like good or bad, I had no idea. And so as I started kind of going deeper into this book and I was trying to like figure like, how do we help people find the right things? I started, and I, I do everything in front of a whiteboard. So I'm in front of a whiteboard, I'm sketching out all these different markets and different things. And I started realizing, I'm like, if you look, if you really break it down, there are three core markets that almost every business is based off of. And those three are like health, wealth, and relationships, right? Yeah. And what's interesting is when, like whoever the first person ever was that was like, a health expert or a wealth rec expert, or relationship expert. Like, they were the first ones. And so like they came out and it was probably like Tony Robbins, right? He was like the first personal development guy. And then like everyone comes to him and it, it was there. But then eventually, you know, everyone starts looking around saying, wow, there's a lot of people in, in you know, I, this guy over here is making money health. I can teach health. And they jump in and suddenly like it starts getting more competition. Like it's harder and harder. And so from those three core markets, health, wealth, and relationships, then from there, like it breaks out into like a sub market. So sub market for me, like let's say in the wealth, in the wealth market, some markets might be like finance and investing and real estate and sales and internet marketing or whatever, right? There's like sub markets within wealth. And then in relationship, there's sub markets like love and dating advice and marriage advice and same thing inside of, of health. And so eventually like people start, started kind of breaking down and going to these sub markets. And at first, again, it was like a blue ocean, right? Like the very first sales trainer was like the only person there and made a ton of money. But then like all the other people started looking like I can do sales training and it got bloodier. You know, the more people came in that market, it got harder to compete. And so we go from like the three core markets, health, wealth, and relationships to a sub market. And then for you to really kind of carve out your spot, it's going one level beyond that. So let's say you're, you're in wealth and then you're in real estate. Like what's your, in the ecosystem, like which part, like what's the niche of, that you own inside that ecosystem of real estate or inside of sales or inside of dating advice, wherever that might be. And I call that the niche. So we go from the three markets to the sub markets to the niche. And the niche is where like, that's where you kind of find your sweet spot where you, you can own some territory and be the person in that market and, and be unique and not be competing with you know, hundreds of other people. Okay. So I love this concept and I like how you break it down, but I know that so many people are going to say, well, how do I figure out what this niche is supposed to be? Like what, what kind of advice do you have for people there? You know, it's interesting. Like, one thing I talk about in the book, a lot of people, they'll say like, I need to go pick my own niche and they'll be like, okay, I'm going to do, I'm going to be a weight loss guru. I'm going to do and <laughs> Right. <laughs> like the, the definition of like picking a niche by default means you did it wrong. It means you're jumping into a place that there's a whole bunch of other people already in. That's why you picked one. And I'm always, I'm a big believer in like not picking a niche, but like creating one. Like one of my first mentors, when he was talking about it, he said like every market has like this ecosystem and you're looking around and like, okay, in the ecosystem of let's say it's weight loss, right? There's people talking about like high fats diets and low fat diets. And there's people talking about cardio and like, there's all these different people. And so it's looking around like, cause people do all, all sorts of things. Like where, like, what can I create that, that complements this, but it's different so that I can be the person that's, that's unique inside of this, this marketplace. That's what I'm always kind of looking at. And I always look at like your potential customers, the people are gonna be coming to you. They're already they're already trying to get the result that they're looking for, right? Like if someone's, if you're in the weight loss market, like people are coming to you, they're already trying to lose weight. They're already trying some, some opportunity, some vehicle to do that. And you're kind of convinced and saying, look, this thing you're doing is not working. You should try mine instead. You need to have something that's different. Otherwise it's hard to say that. Right. You know, I can't be like, oh, you're doing a high fat diet. So do I, you should try mine instead. Like <laughs> that's not a very good argument, right? right. It's got to be something unique and, and different that you can kind of create for yourself. And I think this is one area that people want to just quickly just identify something and move on and do the cool marketing stuff and all that. <laughs> but I think that they've, they've got to spend some time here for sure and really dig deep and do the research. Yeah. And for me, like my research phase is like being in that market and looking around, what are people talking about? What are they excited about? Like, how can I add something unique to this conversation that gets people to connect with me. Yeah. And I, you're right. So it takes, it takes a while. Sometimes, like you said, people think that's like a two minute question, but I know people have spent months trying to figure that out sometimes. But when you, when you get it right, like it makes the rest of your business moving forward so much easier. Uh, so much easier. That's for sure. Now, I know you have many different businesses and you said that once you identify an, a niche, you ask yourself a few questions to make sure that that particular market will be able to sustain your main niche. So can you walk us through these questions that you actually ask yourself in your own businesses? Yeah. So one of the first questions I like to ask is I want to know, like, are people in this, in the sub market, right? So like, let's say I, I'm going to be in real estate. I'm going to be teach people how to flip houses on eBay, which I actually know someone who does that. So that's cool business, right? Yeah. So I'm going to come back to the sub market. So in the real estate market, if I came to all those people and said, Hey, I'm going to show you guys how to flip houses on eBay would they be like extremely excited about that? Or they'd be like, oh, I've heard that before. They'd be bored. Like I want to be able to come into a room of people that are in that market 
tell them the, the concept and have them just go crazy with excitement. Like if they're not excited, they're not gonna give you money. Like that's just kind of how it, yeah. it comes down to it. So that's number one. The next thing is I want to see, I want to ask myself, like, are the people in this market irrationally passionate? And I heard that initially first time from Frank Kern, he said that irrationally passionate. And I started thinking like, I think about the, the topics in my life that I'm irrationally passionate about. There's things I'm passionate about that I care about, but there's four or five things that I'm like irrationally passionate where like money is no object. Time is no object. Like I'll do anything to like spend time and learn and geek out on these, these things. And I want to find a market that feels that way as well, because if you're going to be prolific and create a lot of stuff and do things and like all those things that go into it, like if, if the people aren't passionate about it, they're not going to keep coming back over and over and over again. Right. Right. So it's like where, where are the markets that they're irrationally passionate? And you can tell that people are, you can tell those markets because usually there's a lot of stuff happening. There's events, there's telesummits, there's, you know, there's oh. people selling products. There's, there's stuff happening already. And that's a good sign. Like, okay, these guys are, are really excited. Like their free time they're spending here talking about this and doing this. Ooh, that's a good-, a good indicator. Like a lot's going on around that specific topic or market. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. People always going to be like, I figured out this market. No one's in it. Like, <laughs> and they're all excited. They found this little, this gem. I'm like, no, that's not typically, that's going to make it way harder. I want to find someone that are already passionate. And then I come in with my new, my new opportunity, my new message that gets all those passionate people to look at me and then come over towards me. Cause, cause I've got the new shiny object that they're excited about. Right. This is what I love about your content in this book is that you're saying there's this market that they're irrationally passionate about, but then your niche is going to be that new opportunity for them that they haven't thought about. So yeah. you're kind of taking it up a level and you're saying, are they irrationally passionate about the market in general? And that would be like the sub market, right? Yep, exactly. Cool. And okay. that, that's the big thing. People think they have to go create desire. Like people already have desire. You just have to be, to come into that desire and be like, look, you're, you're trying to get this result. This is the thing you want. I found a better way Like, come over here and let me show you. And you're just channeling that, that excitement into what it is you're doing, which makes it so much easier than trying to go and like, I remember one of my, a guy I worked with a long time ago, I remember the question I asked him and I said, Hey, how do I create traffic? He looked at me, he's like, dude, traffic's there. You don't have to create it. You just got to find the traffic that wants what you, you have and like step in front of it. Like yes. that's the big secret. And I was like, Oh, that's way easier <laughs> than trying to create this. Amen. <laughs> Desire's there. Yes. I love yeah. that. Okay. So what's your third question you ask yourself? All right. The third question, this is important. Are the people, there's two things. Are they willing and able to spend money on information? Because sometimes people are willing, like I have a friend that was in the video game market. He sold this course for a thousand bucks to teach people how to play Halo better. And those kids are very willing to buy that course. They're just not able. And their parents aren't going to give them a thousand bucks to learn how to play a video game better. Right. Oh yeah. And in other markets, people are rich. Like I have a friend that was in the end. He, he tried for a while. He was in the engineering market and they were all able to spend money. They had money, but those guys are not irrationally passionate about anything. And he was not, they were not willing to give him money. And so he struggled. So you got to find markets where people are both willing and able to spend money. One of my rules inside of my company, inside of minor circle and things like that, we always tell people like, in fact, we had one guy who was guilty of this and we actually wrote it on his arm in a magic marker at our last <laughs> meeting. It says, do not sell the broke people. Cause like you can do that, but like, it, it's hard. Like I want to, I want to sell in the markets where people actually have money and they're excited about spending money. Cause then you don't feel guilty taking money from them. like, it's exciting for them and for you. And so right. like, we don't sell the broke people. We want to find people who are willing and able to spend money on what it is you're trying to sell. <laughs> That's a good one for sure. Okay. So once you've decided on the specific niche that you want to go after, you hit home this importance of becoming this charismatic leader. And in the book, you've got these rules for becoming a leader. And I'm not going to give them all away because I definitely recommend my listeners check out the book, but there's two that we've got to talk about because they're so good. The first one is don't be boring. And when I heard that, I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's been said before. Obviously you don't want to be boring. But then I started to read that chapter and you talk about this thing called the prolific index. So I read it and I was on a plane. We were just coming back from a family vacation in Aspen and I was on the plane reading it and I put the book down and I like let out a big sigh. And my husband Hobie's like, what's the deal? I'm like, this guy is so smart. This book is so good that I'm reading it too fast and I feel like I'm going to skip some stuff. I'm devouring it. So this was probably one of my most favorite parts of the book. So can you walk us through this prolific index and what it means? Yeah. And the first time I mentioned prolific people, they're always like, they think there's one definition of prolific, meaning like you create a lot of content, which is true. Yeah. This is a little different. This is like creating content that is unique and different. And so 
if you can envision the index, right, where in the middle, there's this thing called the mainstream. And then on the sides, there's a thing called the crazy zone, right? <laughs> so uh, let's just go into like the health and fitness market, right? So the middle, the, the mainstream is like what they teach you in school, that the government issues, right? So it's like, here's the four food groups, or I guess it's maybe it's food pyramids now, whatever, like, <laughs> you know, I remember learning in, in high, in school was like that. The super and boring if, stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And if, and if I go and create an info product, like, hey guys, I'm gonna teach you this thing called the food pyramid. <laughs> and I'm all excited. Guess what? No one else will be though. <laughs> they're, right. not be ex- they're like, yeah, we got that for free in school and it was kind of boring then. And it's still boring today. Right. Yep. So there's that. Then you go on like on the either ends of the spectrum and it's like the crazy zone. And so a good example, of the crazy zone and weight loss, it's actually, so I tease about this, but I actually really liked it a lot. There's a documentary called eat the sun. And it's about these Indian tribes that like haven't eaten in like 20 years. They just look at the sun, they're sun gazers what? and they get all the nutrients they want from the sun. And so like, first off, we should all watch the movie because it's like fascinating. But okay. if I was to come out with the program, I'm like, Amy, this is the deal. You are going to lose a ton of weight. This is how it works. You don't eat anything. You just look at the sun for 30 minutes a day. I'd say you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No one's going to, no one's going to give you money for that either. Right? Like, and so it's like in the mainstream, no one gives you money on the crazy zones. No one gives you money, but in between there, there's this spot that I call the prolific zone where it's like you share these ideas that are unique in the weight loss market. One of my favorite ones, one of my friends, Dave Asprey, he came out. If you heard about the bulletproof coffee, Love bulletproof it. diet or anything, he came with his, his origin story. He talks about how he was hiking in the mountains, the Himalayan mountains, and he was, he was hungry. And he was cold or whatever. And he went into this place and these guys gave him this tea that had yak butter in it. And he drank this stuff and he made him feel full and he felt healthy and like his brain lit up. And he was like, why does drinking yak butter make me feel good? And he went back home and he realized that if you put butter in your coffee, you can lose a bunch of weight and feel awesome. And that's like, it's kind of crazy. Like if I told my mom that she would think I'm insane, but it's interesting enough that someone would be like, okay, I'm going to put some butter in my coffee and we'll just see, Yeah. right? It, it's in that prolific zone. And then they try it and whatever result they get, if it's something positive, then, then they buy in and then all of a sudden they're, they become irrationally passionate, which people are. If you watch the Bulletproof Coffee movement, it's insane. There's people oh, on like yeah. Jay Leno talking about it all. Or uh, Howard Stern? Anyway, the, the to- yeah, the talk show, like always talking about it. It's just, it's interesting. So like, that's the, the key is like finding that spot in the prolific zone where you share things. It's not crazy with a discount unit. It's not mainstream where it's boring, but it's like, wow, that's an interesting idea. I'd never looked at it that way before. It's just interesting that that's, you know, and that's what gets people to pay attention. And those who pay, pay attention. Like that's where the money's at is right in there. I think that is so smart because when people are thinking about their ideas, they got to look at this index that you've created in this book and kind of weigh against it. So I loved, loved, loved it because I too always thought prolific only meant you're just churning out content and you're saying, no, it has to do with being inventive. And I think that's really cool. Okay. So you've got this rule about don't be boring, (laughs) but you've got this other rule and it's to care a lot, but there's this great twist with it. So you say that charismatic leaders show people that they care and part of caring is charging for your services. And (laughs) I love that you make that alignment between caring and charging because my audience definitely struggles at times with one pricing their programs and then two charging enough that they actually are earning what they're worth. So talk to me about this connection between actually caring for your customers and charging for your stuff. Yeah. And I, I totally get that too. Like, I think most of us who have expertise in something like we, we don't get into it because we want to make money. We get into it because we're obsessed with it. Right. Right. And it's had a result on us. And we're like, wow, this changed my life. And you initially want to share with other people and you start going out there and you're sharing it. And so we always have this like underlining guilt of charging. And I, I, I feel that often. I know other people do, but I look at back in my career, like as I've been doing this, when I first got, when I first started having success with like the marketing stuff. And I was like, I can't believe that I'm getting paid to do this. And I got so excited, right? And I started telling my my mom, my dad, my family, my friend, like everyone who would listen to me, I'm like explaining this thing to them. And I'm like, come to my house. I will just do this for you. And they yes. get all excited and they come over and then like, and nothing, it was so frustrating because nothing ever happened. And like, I couldn't get people to take action when I was just giving this stuff for free. And I was like, like, I cared so much about it. I'm like, don't you guys understand? Like, this has dramatically changed the quality of my life. It will for you too, but you, like, you have to do something. And they just, they wouldn't. And it was frustrating. And then, you know, a little while later, I started doing seminars and workshops and things like that. And I would charge people for those. There was this really weird correlation between what I charged and people's ability then to follow through and actually get the result that they wanted. And so first I, their things were not that expensive and I would do stuff and some people got results, but it was harder. And then I started raising prices. And like, every time I raised prices, the people who were able to come in because they paid more, and I said it earlier, but they, those who pay, pay attention, right? They, they paid more attention. In fact, I remember a couple of years ago, it was my very first like $25,000 workshop, which is funny looking back now. Like I never thought that was impossible and it scared me. And 
but I did it and then people paid them. We had a whole bunch of people come to it. And about the time I had a couple of people I knew in my life who were just like asking me questions about how this whole thing worked. And so I was like, well, these people pay 25,000, come to this workshop, come and just pay attention and like, and do it. And so they came, they listened and they went home. And what's interesting is that the success rate of people who paid the $25,000 to be in that room is hundred percent. Every single person got their money back plus a huge return on their investment. The failure rate of the people that allowed to come for free was also hundred percent. Not a single person who didn't pay, did anything with it. And it's just such an interesting thing. And so like, I look at my life as well, whenever I, I want to change a part of my life. And so I, I hire coaches for like everything else I'm screwed up in my life. Right. And I hire a coach. <laughs> and the first thing is I write him a big old check. Cause I'm like, if I give you a check and I give you money, like there's some accountability. I'm actually, I'm probably going to do it now. Whereas the other way I, we don't as humans, we don't. And it's like, I realized that the more I charge, the better result people get. And I, I always struggle with that, but I see it. It's like, if I really care about my people, like I have to get them to invest in themselves. Oh, for sure. I don't think there's any surprise that the people that pay me thousands of dollars have the best testimonials versus I've got a $97 program. And it's like so much agony trying to get a great testimonial out of that because they're not doing the work. Yeah. And so, yeah, I love the quality of people I attract with my higher price products. So yeah, I'm totally with you too. there. So I'm going to keep remembering that, that those who pay, pay attention. And yeah. you also said the the more success that you have in your own business, the less time you have. So you've got to yeah. charge accordingly, which is so true. Yeah. I remember I, when I first started my business, I was so proud that I answered every single customer support email. Yeah. And that was like a, that was like a badge of honor for me. But then eventually it was like, I was spending all day, every day doing that. And then I couldn't serve and help other people. And it was like, if I really want to have the impact on the most amount of people I have, I've got to create barriers. And like you filter people through, through money, honestly, through price tags, like the more, Again, with my books, I try to give them for free or as close as possible because I want people to have an impact. But the people who really want those results, like they pay and then they get closer to you and you can focus more time and energy on them. But yeah, you gotta, you gotta be a guardian of your time. And you know, that's one of the easiest ways is to do it through that as well. So very true. Okay. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit because we talked about being a charismatic leader, but the second part of this whole idea of creating this mass movement is to actually create a future based cause. And I want to pull from your own experience because I love your stories throughout the book and the examples you share, but you told this big story in the book about coming up with the tagline, you're just one funnel away. And yeah. I thought that was brilliant, but it's really cool that what that did for you, why you came up with that. And the fact that now you have this culture of funnel hackers that are incredibly passionate. I mean, I see him all over the web. And so <laughs> talk to me about this whole idea of a future-based cause. Yeah. When I was writing this book, I was studying a lot about different mass movements, everything from like super positive things to really, really negative things from religion to business to, and everything in between. And I was looking at the commonalities and like you said before, everyone had, had a charismatic leader. And the second thing they all had was this future-based cause. And most of us in our products and our services, like we're selling something, we kind of give it to them and, and it's a transactional based thing. And as I, I started realizing that all these mass movements had a cause like that, I was like, well, what's our cause? Like, you know, we're selling people software, we're selling them books, but like, I want my customers, I want my true fans to be bought into more than just this, more than just a software product, right? Or more than just a book. And so we started trying to create some things and our, before our last event, I was sitting there trying to write a headline for the page that sells the sells our, our event. And I was, I was looking at different swipe files and things trying to find like the right headline that, that spoke our message. And I remember I found it for those who've studied some of the old, old time marketers, there's a guy named Gary Halbert and he had a, an ad that the headline was like, you're one, I think it was one sales letter away from being rich. And I read that and I was like, it didn't really inspire me, but I was like, that's kind of cool. So I remember I wrote the headline of the page. It was like, you're one funnel away from being rich. And I was like, ah, so shallow. <laughs> like that's not, <laughs> and so I deleted like being rich. And I'm like, well, what do my people want? And I was like, well, so for some people it's like, uh, you're one funnel away from getting your message out to more people. So I wrote that and I was like, okay, that's more inspiring. But like some people, it's not about getting a message out. Some people it's about leaving a job they hate. So I, I deleted it. I one fun away from, you know, quitting the job you hate. And I delete and I'm like, oh, that's not everyone. And I kept doing that four or five times. And eventually like I deleted the end of it. I had, you're, you're just one funnel away. And I'm sitting there thinking and thinking, and I look at the screen and I was like, you're one funnel away. And I got the chills. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, that's it. Like I want my audience to understand that wherever they are in their business, like whatever they're trying to do, if they're trying to leave a job, if they're trying to make money, if they're trying to get their message out, like that they're literally one funnel away. And I started thinking about, you know, in my own personal life, like for me to get to where I, I got to, like I, I launched so many things and I failed over and over and over and over again. But then there was like one thing that was the, the thing that broke. In fact, in my live event, I, I, I did a 90 minute session. And I just told everyone of the stories about how I almost went bankrupt. Oh my and like, gosh. Everyone's like, 
and I was like in tears half the time and everyone's like, that was the most inspiring thing. Cause I realized that like, that you were just like, you didn't know which funnel it was, you didn't know which thing it was that was going to get you to success, but you kept doing it. And all of a sudden like, boom, that was the one that looking back, that was the one that did it. And so for me, that, that was the, the cause is like, one of these things is going to hit and it's going to work. And so for us, I became this calling card. And I remember after I put it out on the page and it was live a week or two later in our Facebook group, I saw a message from someone. He said, I woke up today depressed and sad and I was ready to quit. I was planning to cancel my ClickFunnels account and kind of just, you know, being done. And I saw that headline and he's like, I, I realized that I haven't hit it yet, but I could be like one thing away. Like I'm so close. And, and this guy that told this story, it was so emotional for me and for everyone else. And I was just like, and he got it. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is it. Like now everyone is kind of moving towards this thing. Exactly. And it was interesting in the book, I, I shared some of this, but you look at like the political elections yeah. and you look at, I did research all the back clear to George Washington. I was looking at like the campaign slogans from the winners and the losers. And almost every time the winner's campaign slogan was something about this future thing, you know, like one funnel away, make America great again, change. Like it didn't matter if you're a Democrat or Republican, but the person who always won was like the person that had this message, this campaign slogan about the future of where they were trying to go. And so for, for us and right talk about the book is like, you need to pretend like you're almost like running for president of your, of your little tribe. Like what's the slogan that's going to get people inspired to like follow you and listen to you and like immerse themselves in what you're doing and what you're saying so they can get the result that, that you're promising them. Anyway, it's kind of cool when you start really digging deep into it. It really is. I feel like this is the part of the book that really got me inspired. I don't really have a cause around what I do. I've been really fortunate to be successful and impact lives, but this cause, this idea of the funnel hackers and you're just one funnel away. And in the book, you talk about writing a manifesto and the fact that people wear t-shirts with these slogans on them and they are like part part of your tribe. They feel like family to you. That's what I truly want. So yeah. it really inspired me. I think my listeners, when they grab the book, they're going to be like, okay, I want something like this. And you give a lot of yeah. different examples throughout the book that I don't want you to give away, but I think it's going to get people thinking how they could do it in their business. So That's cool. my very, very, very favorite part of the book. And I know I'm saying that with every chapter, but the, <laughs> the very, my very favorite part was when you talked about this idea of bringing the four minute mile concept into our own businesses, you tell two stories and I know you're going to share them with us here, but John Reese was one of the stories you're going to talk about was like internet marketing was a really big, big deal in me coming and creating my own business because he was part of the Frank Kearns and Jeff Walkers and Evan Pagans and you when we did the new money masters with Tony Robbins. Yeah. And so yeah. since I got to work on that product, I started to know all you guys. And then to know that he really made a difference in your life too, I thought was really cool. So tell us this story, explain this concept of the four minute <laughs> mile and how that works in our own business. Yeah. Okay. So the concept four minute mile, I'm sure most have heard this story before, but Roger Bannister, he was up until the point that he broke the four minute mile, everyone thought it was impossible. And so everyone tried their best, but nobody was able to do it. And then one day he broke the four minute mile and all of a sudden it became possible to all the other runners everywhere else in the world that he'd done it so that they could do it. And so he, after that, I don't know the exact stats, but like tons of people have broken the four minute mile since. In fact, the first yeah. one happened like just a couple months afterwards. And it was like, because it was real. And I uh, think about like for runners, for the, for the, for the mass movement of running, like how that affected people and how it gave them a dream and something to move towards. And I look at when I got started, it has been like 14 years ago now. Jeez. And I was, I was like learning about this whole internet marketing thing. Like my, my only goal at the time was to make a thousand dollars a month. Cause that would have, that would have almost replaced what my wife was making while she was supporting me when I was in college. <laughs> and I was like, if I can make a thousand bucks a month, I can be the man and help you know, provide to our little family. And so that was my goal. And then as I was moving towards that, this guy who you and I know and uh, someone I look up to immensely a, a ton, his name is John Reese. He put out this, this thing. He's like, I'm going to try to make a million dollars in a day. And no one thought it was possible, but except for him. And he put together a campaign and he launched a product called Traffic Secrets. And he launched this thing. And sure enough, in about 18 hours, he did a million dollars. And I remember I was on a family vacation in a little tiny town that didn't have internet access. And I remember I went to the local library to check my email. And as I checked my email, there was an email in there from John. And I think the subject line was like, we did it or something like that. And I read this thing and he talked about how they'd made a million dollars in 18 hours. I remember sitting back in my chair and I was just like, God, like my goal was a thousand dollars a month. This guy made a million dollars in a day. And I started this like, like also like the, what was possible in my life, yes. like my whole vision changed. And I was like, if he can do that, I might be able to make a million dollars in a day. What if I made a million dollars in a year? Like what if that was even, and like also I'm like looking at him, I'm like, he sold a thousand dollar course. He sold a thousand copies in a day. If I did that over a year, it's three sales a day. And I was like, also it became real to me and tangible to me. 
as soon as it became real, then my mind shifted, how I work, sh- like everything shifted and went out there. And within about a year and a half, I'd made a million dollars. The next year, I tried to make a million dollars in a, in a year, in a calendar year, and I, all, I missed it barely. And the next year, uh, I was able to do it in a year. And then from then, I'd done it in a month, and I did it in a week, and I'd done it a couple times in a day. And it was all because like he made it possible. Like, I didn't think it was till he did. And so for, for us, as we were building our funnel hacking movement, I was like, what's the equivalent of that? Like, how do I inspire everyone to believe they could be more and do more? And, um, and initially, you know, we had testimonials we would share out there. And it's kind of hard, though, because – just like a testimonial is one thing, but it's like people looking at it like, oh, well, it's because it's so-and-so. Like they're great and I'm not and they can they can discount it. And so I started looking at I was like, I wonder, members of ClickFunnels, how many members have made over a million dollars in a funnel? And so we went back through the database and we found that at the time, it was like 60-something people had made a million dollars in a funnel. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like this isn't like a rarity. This is happening all the time to people in our community. And so I said, let's make this a thing where everyone like put us on a pedestal. So first off, these people that have done it like – get some recognition, but second off, so that everybody else sees them and realizes that this is not a, like an impossibility, like this possible, it's happening to my peers right now. And so we created a, an award and we call it the two comma club, which, cause in a million dollars, there's two commas. And we made these huge trophies. That's a big gold record with commas etched into it, has their name. And at our last funnel hacking live event, by the time it happened, we had almost a hundred people had won it. Wow. And, and we brought them on stage. We gave everyone these trophies. It was crazy. So we had 1,500 people in the room. And it was a session where we're just giving away awards, which I thought like half of the audience would go sit in the hall. And, and like, right. anyway, that, that session was the most packed session we had. Nobody left as they're getting the awards. And then as I started watching after the event, how crazy people went. There's one guy in our group. He made this video. He posted in our group. And he's like, I got home from Fun Hockey Live. I was so mad I didn't get an award. He's like, so I'm making this real. And he walked into his kitchen in front of his wife, he pulled out a magic marker and he drew a picture of our, of our award on his wall, magic marker. <laughs> He's like, I will see this every day until I get the two comma club. And it's going to bug me until I get it. Cause I know I can do it now. And like, I start watching this and all of a sudden, if you look at our community, like everyone, like that's their goals. I'm getting the two comma club, two comma club next. And it's like, now they're all shooting towards this thing and they know it's possible and they know the path and they've seen other people doing it. And now we're going back and telling the stories of these people. But it's just like, now that the four minute mile has been broken, like it's not hard for them. They, it's so real and tangible. And so for anybody's business, like it's the same thing. Like how do you create something like that, that people can aspire to that's like, I can do that. And if you create that, like people will, will move towards it. And it's, uh, anyway, it's one of the coolest things ever. It is so cool. I can't wait for my students to start figuring out what that four minute mile means for their students and how they could show that they can break it as well. So it, I'm totally excited about that one. Could end the interview here because it was so, so inspirational, but I still got a few more for you because I want to dive into the last part of this whole idea of the mass movement. And that is that you teach people how to create a new opportunity for their audience. And it's different than anything I would have thought. So talk to us about this idea of a new opportunity. Yes, this is, oh, I'm glad we have time to talk about this because this is like of everything, like part of my favorite part, because when I got it, it changed everything for us. It steps back to my research again in these mass movements, right? I'm looking at the positive and the negative, businesses, religion, everything, and every single mass movement that blew up, they all had this thing and it was a new opportunity. So to explain a new opportunity, probably the easiest way is to explain the opposite of that. So the opposite of new opportunity is an improvement offer. I learned this from Perry Belcher, but he would talk about like, if you're trying to sell improvement, that's like the hardest thing in the world to sell. Like if I'm going to make you smarter or better or stronger or whatever, like and it, usually a word with an ER after it, like better, because there's a lot of reasons. One is like, if I'm going to, if I'm going to admit to you that I need to become smarter, I have to admit that I'm, that I'm dumb. Yeah. Like I have to make this huge thing about that. Right. The other thing is that most people in life, like everyone has desire, but most people aren't ambitious. I would say two to 3% of the world are actually ambitious where everyone's got desire, right? So if I'm selling improvement, the only people that will buy improvement are people who are ambitious. That means 98% of the people in the world who, who need what you have will not buy it because you're telling them that they're going to help make them better. You help improve them. And the only people to buy improvement are super ambitious people, right? And so you have to understand like the way we get people to buy is not by playing on their ambitions. It's on playing on their desires. Like the desire they have is what's going to actually propel them forward and move them. And so instead of offering them, like, here's a way to improve yourself, make yourself better. We offer them a new opportunity. Like this is something new. So the way that I always figure out like what my new opportunity is going to be is I look at for my market, what's the result they're trying to get? Okay. My customer's trying to lose weight or make money or trying to whatever that, that re, the big result that they want. Right. And they're currently, they're sitting in some vehicle to try to get to that result. Right. So if I'm in the weight loss, maybe they're doing the Atkins diet and they're trying to get there and they're, they're struggling. They're not getting the result. 
And so if I come back to you and say, look, hey, the Atkins diet's awesome, but I'm going to help you actually implement it. And it's going to make it better. And it's going to, you know, my version of the Atkins diet does whatever. They're going to look at it and be like, I'm in the Atkins diet. It's horrible. I hate yeah. the whole thing. You know, and like they have all this, this knowledge of, of, of why this thing's not working for them. So if I try to make it better for them, it doesn't matter because they already don't believe it works. So I have to come and say, look, that vehicle that you're currently in trying to get that result is wrong. And no matter how hard you try, that vehicle will never work for you. You need to get out of that vehicle. And here's this new opportunity to step in with me. You step in this new opportunity and now we can get over there and get that result that you're looking for. And so we help them to create and, and any offer, any product we're selling, it needs to be a new opportunity. And when you do that, it gets rid of all those things like because it plays on people's ambitions. They don't have to admit that what they're doing is wrong. They're saying, look, the vehicle, the, the system I've been using is wrong. And they take all the personal blame and responsibility off themselves. And they're able to come and make those changes that you need. And there's a dozen other things we talk about in the book. But, but that's like the key when you understand that, that all mass movements, the charismatic leader offers these people a new opportunity that gets them to, to make the change. You think about, think about corporate world, right? It's the opposite of that. Like you come in and at whatever level and then you work for two years and you, then you get a raise and you get, you know, advancement within the company. Like if you look at, that's how, how corporate world works, right? In movements, it's never about like advancement inside of a thing. It's boom, this is a whole new, this is a whole new opportunity. This is a, a different thing. And when you have that piece of it, that's when you get the people to come to you. That's when it changes everything for you. I love the psychology around this whole idea of improvement versus new opportunity. And you get even more into the psychology because you say that the number one reason people don't want improvement and the reason why they will or will not actually join your culture is because of status. And I thought, really? But then when you got into it, it made sense. So talk to us about that. Yeah. So we have this internal dialogue always happening right with every choice right? like i want to do this thing and then in your mind your subconscious mind is like okay if i do that is it going to increase my status or decrease my status and that's that's the dilemma that we're always facing okay and it's a little more complex than that but it's basis that's what it is like if i buy this product will it increase my status or will it decrease it right and so the first thing is they look at it like if i buy this product it's, let's, let's go back to weight loss because it's easy right so if i buy this will i increase my status You're like well if i lose weight yes i will increase my status but what if I don't, then I failed again, then I just decreased my status, yeah. right? And then I'm, I'm actually paying money. So literally there's money coming out of my bank account. They're my, therefore my bank account is getting smaller. Therefore my, my status is decreased based on that. And then the argument's like, well, will the potential increase of status I could have, will that offset the decrease that, I, that I'm gonna have immediately, right? And so that's why there's so many things like putting in guarantees and stuff like that. Like even if you fail, like it doesn't matter because we'll give your money back like that. That takes away the risk. And so there, there's no way they could decrease their status, even if it doesn't work, right? And there's a lot of things you, you can do, but it's all about status. And what's interesting is every time I've ever shared this with almost anybody, they always argue with me and they're like, well, that's true for a lot of people, but it's not true for me. And I'm like, <laughs> what do you mean? They're like, well, because I think I've shared a story like, you know, if you were to, the reason why someone buys a Ferrari is because they want the increase in status, right? I'm going to drive around, people are going to notice me and I've got this Ferrari and my status is increased. And they always say, well, Russell, I would never buy a Ferrari. Like, and I'm like, let me ask you, if you were to pull up in a Ferrari to your kid's school and pick them up, like, what would people think about you? And they're like, oh, they would judge me. They would think that blah, 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 blah. And I was like, okay, so they would judge you. And then what would happen to your status? And they're like, well, it would decrease. I'm like, oh, weird. So it works on, <laughs> I mean, the, the reason why someone drives a minivan also has to do with status, like because of what they want people to perceive them as, right? Yeah. The reason why you, you went to the school you went, the reason why you married the person you married, the reason why you didn't go to the school, the reason why you didn't marry someone, the reason why your kids dress a certain way, like all those things are this thing about status inside of our head that's always happening. And so we have to understand that as we're making offers to people, like that's the real conversation they're having in their mind. And so we have to structure things and frame things in a way where the only thing possible is for them to increase their status, and not decrease their status. Because if they think that, it, that there's potential that doing this thing is going to decrease their status, they will not give you money Ugh. and they will not take the changes they need. So good. So good. Okay. So <laughs> I just had you give away some of the juicy details of your book because I wanted to get into some specifics. I love the stories that you told throughout the book, but there is so much more that you offer. <laughs> and so Obviously, people can get the book for free if they pay shipping and handling. I want all of my listeners to get the book, amyporterfield.com forward slash secrets. But tell us a little bit more about this book in general, because it is so, so good. Yeah. So excited for you guys all to get it. So that was basically just the first section we talked about so far, which is creating your mass movements. That's the first- Like a tiny like, section. Yeah. It's the first 63 pages. So like <laughs> we start on a roller coaster and it keeps getting better. So the second the second step after we talk about mass movement, then it's like, how do you actually create- belief in the people that are listening to you. 
And we don't create belief by trying to sell them something. We create belief through the stories we tell. So the whole next section is like how to tell stories the right way. We call them epiphany bridge stories. And we go deep into like how to tell them and why to tell them and how to build your story inventory. And like, oh, it's so exciting. Like, I cannot wait for everyone to have that part. So good. And then section three, we start taking, we, it's called your moral obligation. Again, this comes back to us as, as producers and experts. Like we're nervous to like get somebody to, to give us money, right? But it's like when you understand that you have a moral obligation to change people's lives, it's like, when you understand that and you believe that, and it's like, okay, I need to figure out how to persuade these people so that I can help them and get them to take the actions that we need. And so that's all about how to persuade people. And we do it through one type of funnel we create. And, and we go through like, basically it's, it's the way that we structure our, our presentations. And I go slide by slide by slide in this book on like how to take all these stories and which story do you put in what order? And like, why does the origin story go here? And why is the story about their false beliefs about their vehicle versus the false beliefs about themselves and where they go and how that, and it just kind of maps out the structure of how you tell your stories in a way to get people to give you money and to move forward with you. And then section four, we talk about the funnels, which is, that's how I geek out. Like, how do you actually structure these funnels? So that someone comes in, they don't feel like you're being sold. They feel like they're getting value at every single step. And they they get excited to give you money throughout the process. And then because of the way that you do it, then they're more likely to actually listen to what you say and actually implement what you say, because it's not that much fun to be an expert who makes a lot of money when your audience is not getting the results that, yeah. that you desire for them. And so it's like, how do you do it in a way where you get money, but you're also able to give them this huge impact and results. So you can have, you know, hundred people a year joining your two comma club or whatever your equivalent is of, of your four minute mile. Cause that's, as a producer, as an expert, like that's honestly the most fulfilling part, as we all know, is not the money. It's seeing the people we serve actually have those results. Like that's what motivates all of us. That's why we get up in the morning. And so that's what it's in the book. And I can't wait for everyone to read it. It's so, so exciting. awesome. I feel like the book gives people a huge shot of confidence. Like once you know how this works, how people think, what you need to do, you are well on your way. And I know so many of my listeners are looking for more confidence in their marketing. It is definitely in this book. Russell, thanks so much for being here. It's such a treat to have you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. So there you have it. I hope you loved this interview with Russell. I absolutely did. I think this book is fantastic. You already know I think that because I gushed about it probably embarrassingly with Russell, but when I find something good and it's all about internet marketing, which you know I'm obsessed with, I just devour it. And I hope you will do the same. So amyporterfield.com forward slash secrets, grab your copy before you miss out, and then we can talk about it online. So let me know what you think. I can't wait to see you again next week. Thanks for being here and have a wonderful week. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Online Marketing Made Easy podcast at www.amyporterfield.com. 